Welcome to the Most Notorious Podcast. My name is Eric Rivenis. So today we've got the second part of my interview with Michael Wallace about his book, Pretty Boy Floyd, The Life and Times of Charles Arthur Floyd. In the first part, Michael talked about Pretty Boy Floyd's early life and his foray into a life of crime. In this episode, he continues with an account of the Kansas City Massacre, as well as details on Floyd's death. We took a quick phone break during the interview, and the interview picks up after I call him back. Here we go. This is John Dillinger. (laughs) Wow, in the flesh. I I thought you were dead. (laughs) Uh, You'd have to be uh, 116 years old now. Many people believe he didn't actually die outside the Biograph Theater. Oh, of course. Of course, it was the same, of course, with Billy the Kid, with Jesse James, uh, with Elvis, with John Kennedy. I mean, it's just amazing. Speaking of that, John Kennedy, obviously excluded from the company of these outlaws. There's a very, one of my favorite quotes about outlaws comes from, uh, of all people, Oscar Wilde. When he was making his lecture tour of the United States in the 1880s, and in Denver, Colorado, at a lyceum, he said, Americans have always loved their heroes, and they tend to take them from the outlaw class. And I, I, think, I think that's true. And I apologize. I hope you don't mind. I went on that long rift. I thought it was important to talk about social bandits and, and the fact that so much is exaggerated about Floyd, really exaggerated about a lot of the others too, but, and again, I'm not apologizing for Floyd, uh, and his family never did, but they, they definitely, like me, believe he could have been taken alive, and I definitely believe that. Sure, I can see that. That, That's something I really want to talk to you about, your thoughts on the demise of, of Floyd, but first, we should really talk about the infamous Kansas City Massacre, it's it's a legendary incident. Pretty Boy Floyd has long been associated with, with this tragic and horrible event. Can you talk about the, the event and then whether you think, based on your research, whether Floyd had anything to do with it or not? Yeah, well, there was a, a, a pretty well old-time outlaw, a notorious, he was really a notorious Oklahoma bandit named uh, Frank Nash, who came to be called Frank Jelly Nash. He had been around a long time. In fact, he had ridden uh, literally with old robbers on horseback. He went back to those days. It was an interesting time. By the early 1920s, robbers were switching from quarter horses to Ford automobiles, you know, like the great king of the Oklahoma bank robbers, Henry Starr. He could rob two banks in town in the same afternoon. And he was really something. And he was killed in 1921. And it was the first day in a bank over in Harrison, Arkansas. And he and his two guys walked in there and were shot down. Uh, He died a few days later. But uh, it was the first time he robbed a bank. It's considered one of the first times a bank was robbed by uh, robbers in a car. You know, so no more wearing dungarees and boots and and a hat and neckerchief, uh, wearing Kansas City suits and driving Fords and wielding those Thompsons. So Nash was one of those transition bandits, and he had been oh sent up to Leavenworth. He was convicted up in uh, Okiso, Oklahoma, up in the Osage country of Oklahoma. Uh, great hideout territory of a train robber. He and Al Spencer, another Oklahoma outlaw who went on to get pardoned and actually ran for governor of Oklahoma. But they had been picked up and Nash uh, was at Leavenworth and managed to slip away. That's a whole story in itself, how he got away. He had a little bit of help on the, on the outside. And then uh, they got some other, there were some other bank robbers and Hard cases, oh, Thomas Holden, Francis Keating, some of those guys that had, had, had also teamed up with the Barker Carpus clan and robbing banks and, and such. And uh, anyway, Charlie, and I, I should mention that George Birdwell, his old partner, by this time was deceased. He 
he made the mistake of, of robbing a bank without Charlie, but taking another fellow. And he told uh, Floyd, I'm going to rob the bank in Boley, B-O-L-E-Y, Boley, Oklahoma. Well, Boley was one of the several all-black communities. Um, only African-Americans over there. It went way back to the to the old times. And uh, Charlie said, you know... <laughs> I wouldn't be going to Bowley and robbing that bank. You're going to, as soon as you hit that town, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. And he said, I know I don't want any part of it, but he, he did. He went and uh, just so happened it was the first day of deer season. And all the men coming out of the cafe and at the bank were carrying 30, 30, were carrying deer rifles. And they just shot him to pieces. And so, he took up, uh, Floyd then took up with a, a jittery young man named Adam Ricchetti. And uh, he was a whole different kind of cat than than Birdwell. He drank a lot. Well, they all drank a lot. Charlie didn't drink that. I mean, Charlie drank, but these guys were pretty hard drinkers. And, and Ricchetti, it was kind of his downfall. He was a real hard case with, with drinking. But they they set out together and, and, and did some... Uh, robberies and, and then got blamed for uh, some other doings that, that, again, they had nothing to do with. And, and it got to the point where uh, these little town bank presidents would say, oh, we got robbed and they got $8,000. And it was Charlie Floyd and his guys. Well, it was some farm boy w- with a big thumb buster and he got 1100 bucks, mostly in change, you know, but so the stories kept growing. That Floyd had to be everywhere at once. He and 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 Adam Chalk and, and Adam were cruising around. They were going up to Kansas City to see their girls and to get a little R and R. And all the while, they're they're driving up through that four west Missouri, coming out of uh, where Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri comes together, shooting up to the north. Adams. Typically, early in the morning, working on a, a jug of hooch, and on their on their way up, they stop in Bolivar, Missouri, where Adam's brother works at a car dealership at a Chevy dealership. And anyway, long story short, they get in there and things turn sour, and a lawman comes in, uh, the sheriff, as a matter of fact, and things don't look right, and they end up they meaning. Floyd, uh, Charlie, and Adam end up taking Jack Killingsworth, the sheriff of Polk County, captive and put him in the car and drive off with him because he had recognized him. He recognized Floyd from from the mugshot, and there they are standing in the Chevy dealership. Well, they had this very circuitous drive up towards Kansas City, in and out, and Adam's getting drunker and drunker and but but Killingsworth kind of strikes up conversations with him. They 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 have another interlude with some with another poor guy, a guy, some I think he was a traveling salesman gets flagged down and they take his car. Anyway, the long and short of it is they get into Kansas City in the wee hours, and they're down in the Missouri River bottoms, right down near downtown Kansas City. And they let Killingsworth out of the car and are on their way. And and Killingsworth obviously gets to a phone and so forth. And first thing he he did before he called the law was call his wife to tell her he was okay. I remember that. And then uh, uh, the law started investigating. But, you know, they were gone. They had all kinds of places to hide out in, in, in Kansas City. But the problem was they were seen up there, and they that placed Floyd in in Adam in in Kansas City. Well, they and they definitely definitely were there. Well, in the meantime, coming out of Hot Springs, Arkansas, is a little covey of law officers, including some bureau investigation agents, and police and actually the police chief of McAllister, Oklahoma was with him and they've they're carrying Frank Jelly Nash, who I just told you about, out of Hot Springs. And they're gonna take him up 
through Kansas City and, and uh, on the train. So <laughs> they leave that little spa, hot springs, supposedly the outlaws paradise and and they start chugging their way up to Kansas City and when they get to Kansas City they've got him trussed up in cuffs in a, a couple of cars uh, this old bandit and they pull into the Union Station still stands there today it's a Kansas City landmark and it, it had been there since Oh, it was built right before World War One. Big monumental building right downtown. The Union Station had been a Harvey house in there. And uh, one of the agents was there, had a uh, had a Chevy, and there was a police car. A couple of them were carrying shotguns. Others had pistols, and they had their pistols out. And they uh, took Nash out, still in his cuffs, and... He was starting to get in the back seat of the car, and there was a little hesitation because this lawman decided he wanted him to sit up front. So he, they put Nash behind the steering wheel and had him scoot over, and the others were, were all climbing in when out of nowhere, at least two well-armed men sprang out from behind a car, and they uh, opened fire with machine guns. Yeah, Nash is screaming, "Don't kill me! Don't kill me!" And of course, he was—he was probably the first one who was killed, which, which led to the theory was he killed intentionally to shut him up, but whatever. And then that old um, Oklahoma police chief, uh, Earl Reed, he went down, shot to death, and uh, some of those boys were shot up pretty bad. One of them had uh, one of the agents had three bullets, uh, never got him out, lodged in his spine. Uh, another one was died on the way to the hospital, head shot, and uh, and there was blood all over and gun smoke and boom and everybody's gone. But there are porters there, station porters and and domestics going to work and and working folks and and folks like that. Well, th- this was a, a pretty big deal, killing these all these officers and and federal agents and of course. J. Edgar Hoover was quite upset. And almost immediately, um, among the first suspects they announced were Charlie Floyd and Adam Marchetti. And they they also named some other outlaws and named Vern Miller, Vernon Miller, who had one time been a sheriff himself, but crossed that thin line. And and then of course Wilbur Underhill was also named, and Underhill may really have been the one that was there. But as far as Hoover was concerned, it was a done deal. It was Floyd and Ricchetti. And the newspapers came out, the Kansas City Star, and they were depicted as crazed killers. And oh my God! And the, it became known, of course, as the Kansas City Massacre or the Union Station Massacre. And, and the official word was that uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, it was Charlie Floyd that was wielding one of those guns that took those people down. Well, it was really Floyd and Ricchetti's bad luck that this happened because immediately Jack Killingsworth, the guy who had ridden with him, the sheriff, he came forward and actually more or less defended them, saying, Listen, there is no way that those boys did that. First of all, he said, and other lawmen said this too, it wasn't their M.O. Charlie Floyd wasn't a hit man. And he had, there's an old country saying, he had no dog in that hunt. He didn't have any uh, grievance with Nash or those other people if it was supposed to be a hit on Nash. But also mainly, Adam Marchetti was fall down dead drunk that night. And there's no way that man could have risen from the dead at dawn to get himself in position to wield a, a Thompson submachine gun. I'm, I'm sure he didn't wake up to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But even more than that is a couple of things. One, Floyd, who 
who didn't go around talking about his crimes, except the time he killed that bounty hunter. He told a reporter how he regretted that because of the man having children. But, you know, he didn't just go around bragging or, or doing anything. And if he did something, he he would stand up for it. Or if he didn't do something, he certainly denied it. And he vehemently denied that he had anything to do with that massacre. And, boy, if you ask any kinfolk of his, they all say that, that he didn't do it. He was he was never, ever a hired gun. And all these people came forward. And Floyd, boy, he put it in writing. He he swore that he didn't do it. He did everything. And, of course, that's, for what that's worth, it's not worth that much if, if, if you're a suspect. But more importantly than that, there were eyewitnesses there who who gave descriptions of the gunman, and none of the descriptions matched Floyd or Ricchetti. Some of them favored Wilbur Underhill, but they certainly weren't Floyd and Ricchetti, not even close. None, and there were quite a few of them there, none of them were taken into account by Hoover or the FBI. None of them. And it just so happened that almost every one of them was African American. And they just they just declared those people's statements useless. Totally useless. When Floyd got settled in, it was just just a few days after you know, the Kansas City massacre, he he even wrote a note or letter totally disavowing any part in the crime. And he sent it to the Kansas City Police Department. And, uh, and this is just days afterwards. He wrote it down in Springfield, Missouri. And it was something like, Sirs, I, uh, I'm Charlie Floyd. And I want it to be well known that I didn't take any part in the massacre of those men at Kansas City. Charles Floyd, you know. And uh, they, they checked the ring and declared it to be bona fide. Uh, but. Uh, that marked him, and and Floyd and Ricchetti were just walking dead from then on, uh, all the way into nineteen into the next year, into nineteen thirty four. Uh, they had to go on the run, and and it was that Kansas City massacre that that really uh, ended up being their downfall, and directly led to Ricchetti's death by execution into Floyd's demise up in Ohio. So anyway, Harvey Bailey, Wilbur Underhill, who knows who it was, but I, for one, don't think it's Charlie Floyd. That's one of my jump balls. I, I, I In my book, I, I tell both sides of the story, but when I say jump ball, I throw the ball up in the air, let the reader tip it, decide what what they think based on what I present. So Dillinger is public enemy number one in July of 1934. When he's gunned down on July 22nd, Charles Arthur Floyd takes his place. He becomes the second public enemy number one in American history. And he is a a wanted, wanted man. And Hoover desperately wants him done. Can you talk about Floyd's final months on the run? July, August, September, all the way up to his death on October 22nd of 1934. Right. Well, Floyd and and Ricchetti, pretty well uh, in in the late summer, said their goodbyes to friends and family. They decided to to head out of the out of the their stomping grounds altogether and, and to go east. Um, back up through that country Floyd knew so well, up through Missouri and Ohio and up into Pennsylvania and, and, and further on. And meanwhile, there are stories building. Now, he and Ricchetti have with him those those same old girls that he met years before who never married him. Their sisters, uh, Rose and Beulah, their uh, given name was Baird, but Rose and Beulah are with them. They're their companions. I'm sure 
Ruby was aware of of this other relationship, but she and and uh, Jack Dempsey Floyd are still down in Oklahoma. Charlie would go in and out of their lives. At, at one time, she and Dempsey made a little money by doing a lecture series. She, uh, she would dress Jack Dempsey up. He was a boy about, I don't know how old he was, then 11, 10, I don't, not even that old, in a white suit. And they would give lectures in high school gymnasiums or churches about called Crime Doesn't Pay. And on a couple of occasions, Charlie brought him to the lectures and dropped him off and picked him up afterwards. You know, that, that was a pretty bizarre thing. It's so interesting. Usually those crime doesn't pay lectures happen after the person is dead, not while he's still on the run and all over the papers. That's exactly right. So, so Charlie and Adam and... Buell and Rose make their way up through New York. They don't stop in New York City. They go all the way up to Buffalo, cold old Buffalo, and they and they get a, a they rent an apartment and they live there the better part of a year. Uh, and all this while, they're you know they they make their way around very carefully, not to be seen. They don't go out together. They're very very. Uh, uh, careful, of course, and, and but they're they're getting a little bit of cabin fever as well, and nervous. And, and Charlie wants to finally he he misses those Oklahoma hills and his family and his boy, and he really wants to get back to Oklahoma. And um, they try to work deals out through emissaries with with the governor and uh, about settling up and of course he, he's hardened on them because of the Kansas City massacre and it's just not looking good so Floyd's thinking well maybe if I go back to Oklahoma you know just show myself in Oklahoma and you know throw myself on the mercy of the governor I don't know it's hard to tell what he was thinking but we do know this that they made the decision to leave Buffalo now now here's here's an important little sidebar about all this. Charlie Floyd, uh, this is another little kind of quirk of his. He he liked to bake apple pies, and his mom and grandmother had taught him to bake apple pies, and and he made a great pie. And uh, I have the recipe from the family. And in there, it calls for these different apples and raisins and all this and that and the crust. And it calls for a, a jigger of moonshine. And then in parentheses, if you can't good, get some good shine, you can use brandy or, or bourbon whiskey. And he he entered a, a, a fair down in Muskogee, Oklahoma. He entered a pie. Uh, of course, nobody was identified. They were, uh, you know, anonymous entries. And and guess who the judge was? It was the high sheriff. And he judged Pretty Boy's pie, not knowing it was Pretty Boy, the best pie that had ever touched his lips. And 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 that that's that's a true story. And the family loves that story. And the reason I told you that is because the foursome took off out of buffalo from their apartment and it wasn't long after that very soon that the agents kicked down the door and came in they had found him and guess what was sitting right in the middle of the kitchen table an apple pie now this is an addition to the story for me i'm taking i didn't i didn't say any of this in the book but I kind of hope that that pie was still warm. <laughs> <That'd be great. laughs> right. Anyway, they left and they worked their way down out of New York State into Pennsylvania in that autumn in October. And, you know, I just, that, that's, that's the best month of the year. Everything's great. You know, uh, the leaves are turning all through there. And they, uh, they just, 
keep the back roads and uh, oh, stop at little country stores to buy groceries and so forth. Don't go into restaurants. And they get down into some of that old territory that that he he uh, knew when he was on the scout with old uh, Billy Billy the Killer Miller uh, back over in that borderland of Pennsylvania and Ohio, just just near that northern tip of West Virginia, and uh, that's where they were down very close to the town of. Uh, East Liverpool, Ohio, right on the Ohio River in uh, Columbiana County, Ohio, right on the river, right across the rivers, Chester, West Virginia. And it's really pretty country, rolling country, wooded, little farms, and um, settled by the English, and, and a lot of them were potters, and there were pottery plants there, still are. Across the river in Chester is where they make fiesta ware, which is Still a highly collectible plate and settings. And, 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 of course, the Depression was on, so a lot of those plants were closed. But that's where they were, and they, they had some car trouble, and they had skidded. It was, it was probably some fog and yeah, bad road. They were uh, uh, down near an area called uh, that the locals called the Silver Switch, and uh, the road was slick, and, and uh, Chalk was driving, and he lost control of the car, and it skidded into a telegraph pole. And they weren't hurt, but that old new Ford was beat up, so they got it back on the road off, off of that pole, but he didn't feel the car was going to needed some repairs. So they didn't want to all go into town together, so uh, he had Beulah and Rose take the crippled car, drive it into Wellsville, a uh, neighboring town, uh, East Liverpool, to get it fixed in mechanic. And while they were gone, Floyd and Ricchetti walked up a, a hillside in, in the woods there to wait. And they took their guns with them, took a few blankets, and, and just went up there to, to wait it out in this, in this hollow. And that, that's when various folks in the area uh, spotted them. And at first they thought the guys were tramps because there were a lot of just men of the road tramps. It was the Depression, guys riding the rails. But uh, they didn't quite look like it. And they, they, some of them went down there and said, what are you fellows up to? And they said, oh, we just uh, live around here. And he knew they didn't. And they were wearing suits and, and uh so he went in and rang up uh some folks and told them that there was a some people camped out below their house down there and then the phone started ringing and pretty soon oh the old police chief and some boys come out from wellsville and uh they get into a little shooting match right away they jump floyd and ricchetti and ricchetti uh is captured they were both shooting 45s, and uh, they winged one of the officers. They didn't kill him, but they winged him. And then finally, Ricchetti's gun misfired in the melee, and and he r- ran. Uh, he was slightly wounded. He got grazed by a bullet in his ankle, but they caught him, handcuffed him. And Floyd, as always, always the Phantom Terror, he uncovered his, he had his Thompson and he let loose a whole spray of bullets and then he ran off and he disappeared and went up and found an old fellow and commandeered a car and went off from there and was roaming that countryside the rest of that day and all night. And I've been in that countryside a, a lot and I know it and there are old canals there and crumbling, uh, canal locks and, and, uh, Again, it was autumn and, and probably pretty chilly at night. He just had on his, his old blue suit and uh, uh, he's pretty beat up and uh, from the woods. But that next morning, he he came up out of the woods after he, he'd come across a, a farmer's wife and gave him some water and she gave him some uh, ginger cookies and apples and he he filled his pockets with them 
And then he went on and came up onto Ellen Conkle's farm. And Ellen Conkle was a widow right off the road in this rolling hill, cornfields. Corn was bell being shucked. And uh, he rapped on her door and, and asked her if he could get something to eat. And he said he was lost. He'd been hunting. Well, it was, you know, it was obvious to Ellen Conkle that this didn't look like a hunter to her. He had thistles all up his suit and he was, his shirt was all soiled and face unshaven. So she said, sure. So he sat out on the porch and she made him a, gave him up a plate of spare ribs and some fried potatoes and such. And, uh, he left her. She still had that. She carried it for the rest of her life, a dollar bill that he put under the plate. And he read that East Liverpool paper about pretty boy Floyd being manhunted out in the woods. And then he asked her if she had a car or as he would say, as people call them back then, a machine. And she said, well, my brother does, Stuart, Stuart Dykes, and his wife, and they were shucking corn. And he went out and said, can you all give me a ride? And they said, well, we can after we're finished. So they were finishing with the corn. And, and Ellen Conkle recalled all this in detail. And uh, she said he paced around and, yeah, an old biplane flew over, which was an unusual sight back in that time. And he watched it, and uh, he was just looking around, kind of um, on the lookout. But finally, they finished with their corn, and they came up and got in the car. Charlie got in the front seat, and Stuart fired it up. And just then, Ellen Conkle remembered she was in the kitchen. She heard more cars driving up onto the ground in front of her house, and she looked out, and there were all these men spreading out. They were federal agents. It was Melvin Purvis, Uber's crack G-man, who gunned down Dillinger and was becoming quite the talk of the Bureau. And some of his men and some local uh, police officers from East Liverpool, including one named Chester Smith, a decorated World War I, sharpshooter and uh, Floyd jumped out of the car and took to running up a hill through um, the car and stubble and Chester Smith later said he, he ran like an athlete he was zigzagging cutting and dodging on that field he had a 45 in one hand and he had another one tucked in his trousers and they said as they watched him run cookies and apples fell on out of his pockets on the ground and Smith knew it was Charlie and he aimed his rifle at him and he was a good shot he had fought in the campaigns as a doughboy in France and Belgium he was an experienced hunter and uh, he fired off around and brought Floyd down he shot him as he said later, and as he said for the rest of his life, to wound him and wound him, he did. He brought him down, and then they ran up on Floyd and uh, Purvis and uh, interrogated him. And uh, they rolled him over, and uh, they said, uh, they asked him who he was, and and uh, he, he asked about Adam, who he was, and, and then they... Uh, one of them called him, I recall, Pretty Boy, and he spat at him, and he said, I'm Charles Arthur Floyd. And uh, there was a little bit more of exchange, but but not much. And uh, there, it was a little after four in the afternoon, and so it was starting to, to get dark, and uh, that's when his life ended. And according to Chester Smith, who didn't talk about it for a long time, but when he did, boy, the story broke in Time Magazine and everything else. Um, he said Purvis ordered him to fire into him. Those were his words, fire into him. And they executed him in the field. And then they picked him up and they put him in manacles and put him inside the uh, they took him off a uh, conical farm into the, put him in the back seat and sat him up in the back seat. 
and drove him into town. Smith said nobody said a word. They just drove back in the East Liverpool. And uh, he had never fired a shot. He had two fully loaded 45s. And they took him back in uh, the chief of police's Chevy. And with him propped up between Chester Smith, the, the guy who shot him <laughs> the first time, and to bring him down with that 3220 Winchester and one of the federal agents. And uh, they uh, finally got in the town. They went to the Sturgis Funeral Home right down on 5th Street in East Liverpool, right in the city. And uh, E.G. Sturgis and, and um, his boy, Ernie, ran that funeral home. It was a big old like a house, you know, big frame. Looks like a house. In fact, today it's a bed and breakfast. And there was a young man uh, working there uh, as a as an embalmer named Frank Dawson. And I got to know Frank Dawson's son real well. And uh, I've slept in that house several times. That was that was the funeral home. And Frank Dawson was the one they when they took Floyd down through the back door. They put him in the preparation room. And he was called upon to prepare the body, so he he, he did the autopsy down there. He, uh, Sturgis was also the county coroner. They had all they had just found an old uh, tramp, a transient you know, body, and brought him in and just dealt with him. And uh, they threw all of his clothes into a ash can, into a garbage can back in the alley. And immediately, people were jumping on those clothes and tearing them up and cutting up swatches thinking they were uh, pretty boys' clothes and all these tattered souvenirs. But they did cut up some of that old blue suit of his swatches of those and gave them away as mementos. And they took the cash from his pockets. He had about 120 bucks, and they thought that would help pay for his preparation. And he had uh, a cameo ring that Ruby had given him on and a watch with the Killer Miller's 50 cent piece attached to it and uh, some other things, some spare 45 and his pistols took all that stuff. Then they, they embalmed him. They washed him up and they put him on a little day bed cot up in the front parlor and put a velvet blanket over him and let everybody come in and walk by him. Just what Mamie Floyd asked them not to do. She said, don't put my boy out on display. And they did, of course. And there's a picture of that in, in my book, a picture of him laying on the autopsy table, too, which I laid on, by the way. <laughs> I don't know why, but I did. And the whole town of East Liverpool came by. And then they uh, they took him down to the train station, a body the next day, and put him on a train. And uh, it went due west and finally hit Missouri. And it went right under those cliffs over by the Missouri River, right under uh, the penitentiary of Jeff City. And it hit Kansas City, where he got the name Pretty Boy. And then it hooked a sharp left and went down in old Indian territory, down into eastern Oklahoma to Salisaw to the train station <laughs> where Grandpa Floyd had missed watching the bank robbery and uh, Dempsey told me about that he said uh, we were all gathered at my grandmother's house that day and we were waiting for my dad to come home and uh, it was late October and uh, we were going to go down and and get his body and uh, bring it bring it back to grandma's house and and then and then bury him so they went down there, his brother Bradley, a World War One vet, and his other kin, and E.W., his little baby brother, who became the sheriff of Sequoia County and was sheriff for more than 20 years, one of the one, most respected lawmen in Oklahoma history, never, ever carried a gun, just commanded that much respect from people. And they waited, and Dempsey told me, he said, I can still hear 
in my head and heart the moan of that train whistle. We knew that train was coming. And it pulled right in and stopped. And we heard a rustling behind us, some kind of movement. And we turned around, and he said, and all of Salisaw was standing there. All the people were standing there, just silent, standing there, waiting for a pretty boy. And then we took his body to Grandma's house and washed it. And my brother and my uncles looked at all the wounds and saw how he had been killed. And there was lots of crying. And on October 28th, they buried him. Biggest funeral in Oklahoma history. Out in the little graveyard in Aikens. Charles Arthur Floyd. There were maybe 50,000 people there that day. And uh, you couldn't buy a flower and Muskogee or Fort Smith or anywhere. And there were all kinds of people there, mostly gawkers. It was kind of a scene. And uh, it was on, it was about that occasion that of Oklahoma, who wrote the ballad of Pretty Boy Floyd later and taught it to Dylan and Joan Baez. He uh, he said, uh, Pretty Boy could be elected governor today and he'd probably make a good one. And that was the end. 30 years old forever. That That's such a great story, and I appreciate you telling it so much. I heard a little glitch with the audio there, and I just want to make sure that listeners know that you were talking about Woody Guthrie, the man who wrote the Pretty Boy Floyd ballad. I was actually going to ask you about the influence that Floyd had on literature and music. And you mentioned the the most famous one, the the ballad by Woody Guthrie. But Floyd was also mentioned in John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Yes, he was, because the fictional Joads were from Salisaw. And and if they had been in life, they would have known Charlie Floyd, known him well. And he was talked about, yeah, Charlie Floyd. Uh, Yeah, Steinbeck. And, of course, what's interesting is is Woody Guthrie, who is is such a a beautiful poet, and his music is so important in his social activism and, and of course he was branded um, during those ridiculous witch hunts as a communist and all this and that and, but now he's widely accepted even in his hometown of Okima in fact we have now in downtown Tulsa the beautiful wonderful Woody Guthrie archives uh, just a great place and because of that uh, last year much too <laughs> You good folks in Minnesota, we uh, were awarded the Bob Dylan archives. Uh, they felt Dylan felt that his archives should be with his teachers. So there's another big archive down the block, and um, that's great. Uh, when Woody turned 100 a couple of years ago, of course he's been long dead, but um, Arlo and and Nora, his son and daughter. And some other folks put together a big music tribute. And uh, they had all kinds of people there, John Cougar Mellencamp. And, and uh, you know, I remember old Paul from Peter, Paul, and Mary, and all kinds of people, Roseanne Cash and Jackson Brown, and on and on and on. And they asked me to do some readings from Woody. We, we had a show at the old Brady Theater in Tulsa, where I'll be Friday night listening to music and uh, just hundreds and hundreds of people on there. And uh, they asked me to do some readings from Woody in between the sets, which I was pleased to do. And when the whole show was over, we all came out on the stage and they said, Michael, you come out with us. I said, well, I'm not a singer. And they said, you come out. We're going to sing this land, a song that would make a good national anthem, actually. This land is your land. So we sang This Land is Your Land. There I am standing between Mellencamp and Jackson Brown, and right in front of me are Arlo and Nora Guthrie. And I look out beyond them in the audience, and I see Woody's little uh, 97-year-old baby sister sitting there surrounded by children just beaming. And Nora Guthrie 
leaned back and looked me in the eyes, and tears running down her face. And she said, Woody's home. I was it. That's really touching. And I have to tell listeners who may recognize your voice that you're a, a pretty celebrated voice artist, and you were in the Disney Pixar film Cars. Is that right? That's right. I was in Cars 1. I was in Cars 2, and now I'll be in Cars 3. And and then I helped Disney Pixar set up Cars Land, the whole village of Radiator Springs come to life out in Anaheim. And, and I'm out there, at least my voice is, in the form of a 1949 Mercury sheriff's car with curb feelers and a nice siren. And I'm looking for tractor tippers like that darn Mater. And if you run with Mater, you're going to end up in the impound yard. Yeah, I had fun doing that. I was the consultant for cars because of my big Route 66 book, which revived the road. So I took the creative team out on the road, and John Lasseter asked me to do the voice of the sheriff, which was I was very happy to do. And uh, and when that Cars won, that's the best one of all. When it came out, on some stretches of Route 66, business went up 30%. Incredible. Yeah, it is indeed. It's all good. So where can people find out more about you and your work? Well, I have a website, uh, Michael Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S, all one word, michaelwallace.com. But if you just Google me, Michael Wallace, you'll see all kinds of things, uh, uh, stuff about my books, about different documentaries I'm in or clips of me on everything from the John Sturge show to, you know, doing readings or whatever. And, 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 and you know, I have a, a nonprofit called the Route 66 Alliance, a preservation organization that's headquartered here. So there's a lot about me in Route 66, Route 66, the mother road, as Steinbeck called it. And, uh, and that, and that's one of my important causes as well. Well, it sounds like a, a great book and a great cause, and I appreciate your time so much today. It's been good talking to you, fun talking to you. You know, uh, once I get going, I'm hard to stop. But I, 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 I only write about things that I have a passion for. If I don't have a passion for it, I, I, I'm not going to write about it. So you just have to put up with my passion. Thank you so much again for your time. It's been marvelous. Well, that's my pleasure. Let's keep in touch. We'll do some more sometime. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.